Excellent. Well, thank you for joining me here today for Tech Tidbit, What's New Google. Um, kind of as we start the school year off, it's kind of nice to touch base on some new things that uh, are available to people that use these different Google products. Um, the copy to the presentation is found right here at the bit.ly link that you see on here. Um, if you want to use that to follow along, you're welcome to do that. If you want a copy of it for yourself, you're welcome to to do that as well. So what we're going to take a look at here today are going to be uh, four Google products here that are part of the Google Workspace for Education suite. Um, Google Slides, Google Docs, Google Forms, and Google Classroom. Um, so maybe not all of them apply to you, but my, my hope is that you could pick up a nugget, a nugget or two um, that you can carry with you or maybe that you're going to feel like you want to share with others. Uh, the first group that we're going to look at here are Google Slides. Um, one of the things that is fairly new in Google Slides is to be able to customize the colors that you use. Um, so for example, if you have a favorite color or you want to use your school colors uh, in the presentation, um, you can find those hex numbers uh, and you can actually paste them into um, your presentations and use your actual school colors if you wish. For example here, a couple of the different hex colors for say like Bram and Princeton. Um, and what I would do here is I would take this number um, or I would highlight any text. How about I do that first? And when you have that text highlighted, you go up to the text color that's on top. And then this area here allows you to choose a custom color. And so there's a plus button right here. When I click on that plus button, I can then type in this hex number that I see right here, uh, or you could copy and paste it as well. And there is that Princeton orange color. I click OK, and it's going to show up here. I'll show you here. I'm going to hit cancel because I've already done it once. Um, I'm going to find that custom color right here, and I can change the text to that color. It also works on the, the fill button if it's a shape or um, also for lines and um, other things as well or, or highlights. Um, you can pick those different colors. And since we bring up this idea of colors and when you're using them in your presentation, um, really try to consider what effective color contrast you're using to make it as readable as possible for all people, not just visually impaired people. As you look at these different boxes up here in this top uh, image, you're going to notice that that contrast one with black on yellow looks great. You could see white on top of most colors really pretty well. Um, but then when you start to pick colors that are on the same side of the color wheel, um, like you see here with the green and blue, it leads to more low visibility um, or it can lead to some vibrations that tend to occur as well. So really try to think if you're picking colors that are on opposite sides of this color wheel, it's going to be much easier for people to read uh, and follow along with. Uh, the next thing in Google Slides um, that is kind of neat here is that you can take an image that you have in your presentation and you can crop it to a specific shape. So I think, you know, like if you select, for example, this Mora Mustang right here, and I go up to where I could always crop that image. If I hover over that little arrow or triangle next to it, it'll say mask image. When I do that, I can select any shape that I want to make it. So maybe instead of that circle, I want to put it into uh, or maybe I want to kind of put that line through it, say no more Mustangs here, and it will change it to that particular shape. I can also, if I want, don't have to choose just shapes. I can use arrows or callouts as well, and maybe I want to turn this one into some sort of an explosion, and then it'll crop that image into that particular shape, whatever it is that you'd like to use. And the last Google Slides one here to share is about using question and answer in presentation mode. But up near the top when you are presenting where you see slideshow, if you click that drop down menu that's there, go into presenter view. You can then choose audience tools and you can open up a Q&A session for your presentation. It will give your attendees um, or your viewers this link 
to where they can go and ask questions and you can set it up to either be anonymous questions or you can set it up where they you could see their name like you see mine right here um, and then you can kind of have that little window open as you present and also then be able to respond to questions that um, your listeners your viewers might have your students or whatever your audience is um, another kind of neat thing here that's um, going to work if you're in that full screen presentation mode is if you press the L button during that presentation, um, you get a laser pointer. And wherever you drag your mouse across, it turns into a laser pointer. Um, kind of a neat little thing, too. Um, so there's our, those are some things here about Google Slides. All right. So in Google Docs, uh, a few kind of neat things here that I'm going to share with you. Um, using the at symbol for shortcuts. So I have this sample document that's also linked here in the presentation that I'm just going to jump to here to share with you some of these neat things that you can do. So this at symbol you can use for right in Google Doc as a shortcut to open up an emoji keyboard. So if I type that at symbol and then, for example, start typing the word smile, I'm going to get examples of different smile emojis. So I can choose maybe the one with heart eyes, or I could do another one. This one worked. I tried it the other day. I could type in goat and hey, I can get a goat right there. And I can use that as like a shortcut to the emoji keyboard. You can also using the at symbol reference different documents, different Google Docs or Google Slides that you're working on. Um, so, for example, if I start with that at symbol again and start typing the name of a file that I know that I have, it puts it in there as a like preview link to your document. So you don't have to look at that, say that big long URL. I didn't have to like highlight it and then insert the link to a, a different um, set of words. And I can actually see what that document is there. I can open up a preview with it. I can also copy that link and share it out to someone else as well if I need to. Um, and that works with sheets and docs and slides um, and I think even forms. You can also use that at symbol if you are referencing different people or different emails. So for example, if I want to, just because I know I saw him in there, reference this person right here, I could start typing at in his name and then pop that in and there is his email that pops up. Thanks for letting me do that, Corey. Uh, you can also do that for dates. So for example, I type in today's date, 9-14-22 and I can drop the date right in there as well. Kind of some nice little shortcuts um, and it makes them stand out in documents as you're looking at them. Uh, the next Google Doc thing here to share is about um, some insert features. There's two of them that I'm gonna show you, table templates and drop downs. So I'm gonna go back to my sample document right here. And right here I have a table, you should see that now. Um, that I've inserted. And to find those table templates, I go up to insert, down to table. And before, you know, you could set your number of rows and columns for whatever you want it to be. Now there's a feature up here that says table templates, and they have four different ones right now that you could choose from. Uh, let me just pick this one for a moment. Um, and this one could work for someone maybe that you're doing peer reviews of different um, essays or stories perhaps that kids have written. And each of these different areas are editable. So I could write peer reviewer here if I wished. Then you get these different drop downs here and you can add and edit and change those and give them different colors if you wish. You can also you know, allow a spot for someone to be able to type notes and basically kind of a way to keep track of different information there. Not only can you insert tables, you can also insert drop downs right into your Google into your Google Docs as well. So maybe you want to find out what people want for lunch, you know, and you go then, let's add another one here. Let's say pick on Corey here again. Um, and I'm going to go up to insert and then to drop down. And I've created a few different drop downs, so you'll see some of those in here. So I just want to go to choose one that I have here called lunch. 
and pizza and maybe Corey wants a cheeseburger instead. Um, and this could be kind of a good thing for letting kids, if they're going to have some sort of free choice time, but you're going to limit it to four or five different options that kids could choose right on a document, um, the thing that they wanted to, if you had shared it with them. Um, that would be one way to use that. I'm sure there's probably several others um, that you could probably come up with on your own too. The next feature is editing multiple, multiple text selections at one time. Sorry. This is also kind of a, a neat thing here. Uh, I'm going to show you on my document. So say I'm looking at uh, this piece of text um, and I want kids or I want someone to kind of like highlight for me all the times that the word constitution appears in the document. So I could go like this here. I'm going to highlight this first one. Then since I'm on a Mac, I'm gonna pr press that command key. It's that one with those weird squiggly kind of lines. Um, if you're on a PC or a Chromebook, it would be the control key. And I'm gonna hold that down and I'm gonna go to every other time that I see that word constitution and I'm gonna highlight it here. I might get them all, I might miss one or two, but you're gonna get the idea. Constitution, constitution. Now, if I wanted to format all of these uses of the word um, so that they're the same way, maybe I want to highlight them, I can then go up to my highlight tool and I can choose the color that I want to highlight them in. And it changes the formatting on all of those different parts all at the same time. Um, so kind of a neat little shortcut here that is added to what you can do. And again, it's probably one of those things, if you think about how you may use that, um, you might come up with many different possible um, uses for that. Um, and then this is one that I just found out about, I think, last week. You can take an image and you can transcribe the text that is found on that image so that it becomes editable type. You can also do the same thing for handwritten text. So I'm gonna play this video here as I talk about it and it will hopefully play. There we go. So if you have an image file on your computer, the trick here to opening, before you open it in Docs, you have to upload it to Google Drive. Once you've uploaded that image into Google Drive, you highlight it, select it, and choose Open in Docs. And it's going to take the text that's over the top of this image that you'll see here. It says, make a ripple start a wave. And it put it down right here. So now I can do whatever I want with that text. And that was from an image. Now we'll do something similar here with handwritten text. So again, you have to put it in Google Drive first, then highlight it, go up to the three dots on the top, and choose open so here's some of the handwritten stuff that i i did then go choose open with in google docs and you're going to be it will transcribe that handwritten text for you i know it'll appear kind of small here but it is the words that i wrote and it just put it on here in um typewritten text that i could then edit so really kind of cool um, thing to come back to and try when you have an opportunity. Uh, the next part here that we're going to move to is on Google Forms. Um, in Google Forms, remember that you can adjust your settings. You don't have to use the same default colors. You don't have to use the same default banners. Um, and one thing that I like to remind people of is when the form is completed, you can include a personalized confirmation message. It doesn't have to just say, thank you for filling out this form, right? You can add whatever it is that you want to on that particular form. So let's take a look at where I would find some of those things. So if I have this awesome form here and I wanted to be able to add my own personalized message at the end of it, if I go into settings, and then choose presentation. You could see where the confirmation message appears, click edit, and you can change that text to read whatever you want it to read. Um, you can include links to other things in there. If someone had finished a test and you're saying, when you're done with your test, I want you to read this thing and this article, and then there you can link it right there when they're done with it. Um, so that's kind of a, a neat little personalized thing that I, I know I appreciate when I fill out forms. 
Uh, let's see, the next thing here that I wanted to share about Google Forms is being able to customize the themes, the color palettes, the fonts um, that you use for headers and text messages or text boxes, et cetera. So if I go back to my form here once again, and I'm gonna use this color palette that's up here in the top part of the screen. And when I select that, I can do things like change the text style. So if I want my header to be a different font than the rest of my document, I can go and choose a different form, um, a different font. I could choose a different size for it. Um, I can change what the question part is, and I can change what the text um, part of it would be as well. You can also add your own image to the header. You can also once again, add your own custom color to what this happens to be. So all of those things work pretty well here. So you can, the same as you added the custom colors um, in Google Slides, you can do that same thing here. Um, and it works really kind of nice too. And one last thing here about Google Forms, um, you can, this is not a Google Form thing itself, but it comes from a third party um, marketplace add-on called Form Eliminations Add-on, which allows you to limit the number of people who can choose a particular response. Like for example, let's say you wanted to, to ask your kids um, what they wanted to do for indoor recess. And just because of logistical reasons, you can't have them all doing the same thing. So you can set up a choice menu here where your options are reading a book, playing Minecraft EDU, playing cribbage, or being on the cleanup crew. And for this purpose, I, I did an example of, I sent um, a maximum amount of five people for each of those different things. So I'll just like pretend you had a class of 20, you could choose it to be 10 of each, depending on the number of people that you have. Um, and so then when that form comes up, for the students. And what I want you to see here is there were four choices before, but now there's only two. Why is there only two? Because this add-on, this form eliminator, reduced out the ones that were already full. So just like with any other form and you're looking at your responses, that you can see them in the Google Sheet, and I can see all of the people that filled it out and what choice they had. But I can also, because this add-on creates another tab, I can look at how many of each of those different ones are remaining. So why did only Minecraft and Cleanup show up on there? And that's because they were the only two that had remaining choices left. Um, it is one of those things you would have to go to install that add-on. Um, and you would have to make sure that your um, Google admin at your district or your tech coordinator has enabled you to have permissions to add those things on. Um, but it, it's a neat extension, um, and I think it uh, works pretty well. Um, there is the link right here that you see is where you would find that particular add-on. They also give you a tutorial video on how to go about setting it up. The key thing that you're going to want to remember, though, is it the only question type that it works for is a drop-down question. So not multiple choice or short answers, those sort of things. The next one, then, which is Google Classroom. Um, Google Classroom, you know, hip, hip, hooray, it's about time. You can now schedule to multiple classes at the same time. Uh, I know when I was in the classroom and I want, you know, I had three sections of a history class and I wanted to send the same assignment out to them, but it was like the day before and I wanted it to schedule to appear the next day. I would have to go to each of those classes individually and schedule them all one at a time. Now in Google Classroom, you can send it to all of those different classes to appear and to schedule right before those classes are about to begin. They don't have to be all or nothing the same. Um, and so this gives you the directions on how to do that. Maybe some of you have found that already as you've dug in into your Google Classrooms for the start of the year. So a very neat feature. Um, a second new thing here that Google has added for Classroom are add-ons for assignments. 
this will bring some of those ed tech tools that maybe you're using frequently to create assignments with um, that are third party applications um, and allows you to be able to create that assignment and choose from the add ons a particular, for example, ed puzzle that you want them to use. So I don't have to go to ed puzzle, set it up, tell Google Classroom to turn it on, send it back to Google Classroom. I could set up that ed puzzle assignment right here inside of Google Classroom. Um, it works for other things like Kahoot or Pear Deck, uh, Google Arts and Culture. I know Nearpod is part of those that you can choose from as well. And I had thought they were adding IXL. I don't know if that has formally happened yet, but I would imagine these add-ons are going to, to become greater as time goes on. Um, if this is something that is not appearing when you are um, setting up your assignments, then it's because your Google admin at your school or your tech coordinator has not either installed or allow listed those classroom add-ons. Uh, okay, another thing in Google Classroom, again, here, not something that is necessarily new, but it is something that it often gets overlooked, and it's called originality reports. Um, this is a great way to check that um, students' work is authentically theirs. Uh, so what it does, if you enable originality reporting when you create this assignment, um, there's a little button that you click to check plagiarism um, or to turn on originality reports. That's right near like where you would set up the, the rubric if you were going to have one. And when you turn that on, okay, it allows for students, first off, to be able to use originality reporting themselves three different times within an assignment to check to see if they have maybe copied and pasted something that they didn't give credit for um, or that maybe something they were rewriting in their own words turned out to be too close to the original and Google caught them on it. Um, and you know it prevents them from turning in something that the teacher might suspect is plagiarized. From the teacher side of it, you can also use originality reports to check for plagiarism. So here is an example of a passage here that the first part here that you see that's grayed out is something I copied and pasted right from a website and Google caught it and it'll tell you here's the website it came from. Um, now, maybe if it's a long quote and the person that wrote it actually cited it and gave credit to the actual person, um, you'll just ignore it and click that's okay. Um, I also then in this next part here with this part of the sentence, um, I took something that I had copied and pasted, but then started tweaking some of the words so that it's not 100% the same, but it's still the other person's idea. Um, and Google caught that as well. Um, they even catch like, you know, common things like life is like a box of chocolates that I totally just typed from Forrest Gump. Um, and so it identified and flagged those different things. Now, if you are a school and you use something like Turnitin or Unicheck, um, that will do many of these same things. You know, you could think of as maybe that Turnitin or Unicheck becomes kind of like the, the summative assessment, and you can use the originality reports as maybe more like the formative, where you're just flagging things and you're sharing that with kids and you're saying, hey, I think you need to fix this before you turn it in for real. Then you can run that um, other unit check or turn it in separately from that. All right, as we're getting to the end here, one final thing uh, about Google Classroom, and maybe it's too late for this semester, but it could be something to consider for next semester, um, is using this course creation checklist um, that I have linked right here to this image. Now, this is not something that I created, but rather something that I found that I thought was very helpful um, that another person had made. And you can go and you can open that up and it will ask you to make a copy. There we go. And it opens up a document here. You can see different steps to how you might want to set up that course, including some of the different settings that you want to think about um, as you do so. As we are done here, uh, those are the ones that I had to share with you about what is new for Google. All right, well, I hope you guys have a great day. Um, if you do come up with any questions, feel free to shoot me an email and I'm happy to help you out with them as best you can. Thanks for joining me today.